game players in here. Are there any gamers here with us today? Let me hear you say aye. We, we've got a few. For the rest of you, maybe this is a, a new experience and we might talk about a few things that maybe you'd heard about but hadn't really seen before and maybe afterwards we can play just a few of these games uh, out in the lobby together. <laughs> Aftermath of World War II is really a significant period here in America. A lot of the technologies that were fostered by the war really come into the American cultural mainstream. To try to set electronic games in context, it's important to talk about this because the television is really central to much of the story in many ways. Television changes not only how we entertain ourselves, but also how we disseminate information in our culture. The rise of television in the 1950s uh, is something that predates, in many ways, the computer movement. Uh, televisions have been available in the 1930s, although they hadn't really caught any wind in their sail in any mass sense until the 1950s. But in the 1950s, late 50s, and then into the early 60s, we have a number of individuals, elites at colleges like MIT and Cambridge, who are using computers, some of the first mainframe computers. And you know what they're doing in some of their spare time with them? They're playing some of the first electronic games on them, right? some of these first games. But this is an elite few playing at this point. There are some individuals, however, who are, uh, <laughs> these ideas are coming into their head, this confluence between play and technology, Ralph Baer being one of those individuals. And Ralph came up with this revolutionary idea in the 1960s. What do you do with a standard television besides watch network programming? And he started developing prototypes of how to play electronic games, what come to be known as video games, on these. These prototypes go on to become the first home video game consoles. A contemporary of Ralph's was a gentleman who goes on to found Atari some years later, Nolan Bushnell, and he's having similar ideas play in technology. How do I put these together? How do I take a television and, and play a game on this? Maybe even put a, a coin slot on this and make some money out of it. Uh, a lot of people at this point weren't very supportive of these endeavors. They thought that this was not something that would be uh, commercially viable, uh, but they persevered. Anybody wondered at all tonight what this is under the sheet up here? <laughs> Now's the time that I, I unmask this. Uh, this is Nolan Bushnell's idea of the first coin-operated arcade game. He pairs with Nutting Associates. And in 1971, this really beautiful machine comes out. I don't think there have been any cabinet games uh, since then that have been nearly as aesthetically pleasing as this. But this was the first coin-operated uh, video game. It was called Computer Space. Gameplay really wasn't all that great on it. It didn't make a lot of money. In fact, there were only about 1,500 of these produced in 1971. And we're very proud to have one of these in our collection. Uh, but very shortly thereafter, you wind up having systems that do have some inroads. Uh, the Magnavox Odyssey, that's what Ralph Bear's prototype becomes. 1972, it is the first home video game console. And perhaps many of you played Pong when that came out in 1972. And that's a system that was very influential, replaced a lot of the pinball machines that you saw in arcades. And then it goes on coming over to the, the television uh, scene and into people's houses as well. From 1972 through till now, this has become a very large industry. In fact, this industry right now is nearly a $10 billion a year industry. In the late 1970s and 1977, Atari, Nolan Bushnell's company, they put out the Atari Video Computer System, the Atari VCS, which goes on to become the Atari 2600. This is the system that really brings home console gaming into your living rooms. Then later in the late 1980s, you have the uh, Nintendo Game Boy that really brings gaming portable uh, and into the backseat of the family automobile. From its early pixelated beginning through to its current graphic brilliance, which is really the only way to describe this, uh, these games have always shared one thing in common, and that's that they were fun. Here you have in the upper left-hand corner, that was your character initially, that little yellow block. Right? That's what you were playing when you had an Atari, and you're playing this action-adventure game. Uh, a few years later, it got a little bit better. You had your pixelated running man when you're playing Night Stalker. That's from Mattel and Television. You can see down in the late 80s, now you have some characters that look as though they might be a little bit more recognizable. In fact, in the, in the lower right-hand corner, this is not a, a screenshot from the movie Iron Man, but in fact a screenshot uh, from uh, Iron Man on the Xbox 360, one of the contemporary game systems. Some of these characters that have come out in these electronic games, too, have become cultural icons. They truly have. Whether it's Mario, uh, whether it's Sonic the Hedgehog, or whether it's the Master Chief from Halo, these are recognizable characters that have meaning in our society. In fact, in the late 1990s, a poll of American school children, in fact, revealed that more American school children recognize Mario than they did Mickey Mouse. What does all of this mean to us? Over the past two years at Strong, 
we've been collecting electronic games. We started from a very modest collection and now have the largest, broadest, and most significant collection of electronic games in the world, publicly held. Uh, what we're doing with these is we are developing exhibits. Uh, we are going to, in 2012, have a long-term, highly interactive exhibit, tentatively titled The Revolutionary World of Electronic Games. We are also collecting things that are outside of what you consider video games. Many people refer to our collection as a video game collection. In fact, it's not. We have a lot of educational software. In fact, more than 6,000 pieces of educational software and also dedicated educational games. Things you may have remembered from your own childhood or from your, your children's. Uh, games like Speak and Spell, Little Professor, things that help uh, to educate us. Because that is something, this cultural impact of these games is quite broad. And more than just changing the way that we play, they are also changing the way that we educate ourselves and also the way that we connect with one another. This is our NCHEC Game Lab. What this is is a, a place where uh, we are taking our collection, we're collecting, studying, and interpreting these games internally at the museum, but we're also wel welcoming uh, researchers and scholars and students to come in and share this collection with us, to do research out of this. More than 10,000 software titles for video games, everything from the earliest games from the Magnavox Odyssey, the earliest cartridge-based systems, the Fairchild Channel F, which came out in the mid-70s, these games are accessible and also the hardware that you would play these on so that you could research how this uh, phenomena has evolved over the years. Also, we have computers set up where you can play some of the computer games all the way from the earliest text-based games. And we just recently acquired uh, more than 100 classic arcade games, everything from this very computer space that's up here on stage through some of the golden era games, things like Pac-Man and Galaga, uh, Miss Pac-Man, some of the ones you may have remembered, uh, up through some of the more contemporary games. So we're very excited about this collection that we're putting together. It's a dynamic, growing collection. Love it if you'd stop out and see us out in the lobby. I've got a, a pocket full of tokens and would love to share some stories with you. Uh, maybe play a game of Tempest. Thank you very much.